Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Vinton, Commercial Co Programs Administrator here at the American Angus Association. Tonight, I am excited to announce Angus University's next webinar, Rev Up Your Replacements. I know a lot of us are hot and heavy into the spring breeding season right now, but some of us are looking forward to that fall breeding season too. So tonight, we have Dr. Patsy Houghton, President and General Manager of Heartland Cattle Company, who will be giving us a demonstration on how to properly develop those replacement females from nutrition, vaccination, and all the way to actually breeding those females. So um, Patsy, thank you for being here this evening. Um, as a former intern of Patsy's, I know you guys are gonna get some very valuable information here this evening. So um, at any point, if you guys do have a question, please use the Q&A uh, click box at the bottom of your screen. Click that Q&A, submit your answer, hit send. We will be compiling those questions at the end of the webinar and hopefully get those answered for you. So Patsy, thank you so much for being here. We are so excited that you are here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Emily. It's uh, always a pleasure to work with the American Angus Association group and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with everybody tonight. Um, we, I, as Emily mentioned, we're probably too late with this presentation to really influence the spring 2020 heifer breeding season, but certainly the information that's provided here this evening might help someone with fall 2020 or spring 2021 heifers and beyond. So that's the way we'd like to approach this. Uh, where you're at with your spring heifers at this point, uh, the die has already been cast basically. So what we're trying to do is be proactive with uh, subsequent breeding seasons here in the, in the relatively near future. I'd like to give you just a little background on Heartland Cattle Company um, and uh, not, not extensive, but just kind of let you know for those of you who don't know about this yard. Uh, uh, this was a yard that was built from the ground up starting in 1990, uh, southeast of McCook, Nebraska. Um, I've owned and operated this yard over the years and we have uh, developed and bred uh, just over 125,000 head of heifers over the years that have represented 31 states. Uh, in between heifer uh, breeding seasons, we did just breed heifers in the spring. Uh, we did wean balling calves in the fall, so we've started about 205, 206,000 head of balling calves over the years. Uh, we fed about 20, uh, 75,000 head of uh, cattle to finish, and we also were a re research operation, so we've conducted about 40 research projects over the years. Uh, so to kind of give you a little bit of my background in terms of uh, where I come at from heifer development and the years of experience and the numbers behind those years. Uh, big picture wise, in a, in a very quick summary for you, this is kind of how we got along at Heartland Cattle Company over all those years. Um, synchronization rate, uh, we averaged 93% long-term synchronization rate compared to an industry average of about 84%. Sur first service conception rate, 70 versus 60%. And seasonal preg rate, this is a total AI program, no cleanup bulls, 45 day AI season. Uh, we average 90 to 91%. Industry average, apples to apples, the same kind of program, tends to run around 79%. And the reason for that is following heat detection all the way through and catching those rebreed heifers is where a lot of places fall off in terms of seasonal preg rate uh, from where they were initially at the beginning of the breeding season. So this just kind of gives you an idea how we got along over that 125,000 heifers over 29, 30 years. Um, and then prior to that, um, I was on faculty at Kansas State University and we bred about 2,500 head of heifers across the state of Kansas each of four different years, uh, probably adding up to about 32 years of uh, total experience in large scale heifer development. So we've known for a lot of years um, uh, that a lot of academics have said that proper heifer development will really influence the subsequent performance of your cow herd. We've known this for a lot of years. You can go back into the into the 70s, um, the, the late 60s, the early 70s, and in that, in that time frame, and know that a lot of people have been talking about this for a lot of years. So if we get heifers developed properly and we do, the, we do the right things, we know that we can positively impact weaning weights, we can allow that heifer additional time to rebreed and stay with the mature cow herd, and anytime we do those things, we can enhance subsequent productivity of the cow herd. 
So what we're going to talk about this evening are some ways to get this done in terms of developing your heifers and some of the uh, management techniques that you might want to consider as you work with your own set of heifers or maybe even you're somebody who wants to consider starting a commercial heifer development business. So reproductive track score is one of the things that we implemented in the very first year at Heartland Cattle Company. Again, you, if you go into the early 90s, the late 80s, you can see that researchers around the country had been working with reproductive track score uh, over, the, over the course of a number of years. And they found that reproductive track score can be an, an adequate and a, an effective indicator of fertility, but it depends on the timing of reproductive track score. You can't just do this at any point in the heifer's development. It can be an accurate indicator of response to synchronization and also synchronized pregnancy rate and breeding season pregnancy rate. So all those things told us that reproductive track score is something that we wanted to implement in our program at Heartland Cattle. So here's an example of how we got along with reproductive track score at Heartland Cattle Company. This is from actual heifers that came through our program at Heartland Cattle. So the, the typical reproductive track scoring system in the university system is a one through five or one through six scoring system. We're doing the same thing, but I wanted to provide a scoring system that I felt like it was a little bit more user friendly for our customers. So the one through five system, the academic system, combines and, and kind of mushes together, if you will, ovarian, tracks, uh, ovarian score and uterine track score. So what we did is we developed a two, three, four system that breaks that out. So look at the bottom axis on this, on this graph. You've got fours, you've got threes, and you've got twos represented. The number on the left of the hyphen represents uh, the ovarian score. So again, using a two, three, four system, a two would be an infantile ovary, a three would be a normal sized ovary, but with no significant structures on it, no palpable CL or follicle, and a four would be a normal sized ovary with a palpable structure showing that she's actively cycling. So obviously the four is where we're headed here. That's what we want to look for. Likewise, the, the, the number on the right side of the hyphen indicates uterine track score. Again, using the 234 system, a two would be a pencil sized tract or an infantile tract. A three would be a normal uterine horn development, but prior to probably being exposed to uh, puberty hormones. So it would be normal, but it wouldn't have gone through that, what I call hormonal bloom, once, um, once um, uh, hormones start circulating freely in that heifer's body when she actually hits puberty. And a four would be a well vascularized uterine horn that is showing evidence of, of uh, uh, hormonal bloom. Okay, so as we look at this, there's all kinds of combinations that you can do here that you can come up with, but to simplify the concept, we just showed a four dash four, a 3-3, which is a normal heifer but prepubertal, and then a 2-2, which is an infantile tract heifer. The 2-2 heifers could be for a couple reasons. One is it could simply be that she's not old enough and she hasn't reached uh, puberty and she hasn't reached a degree of development where she's going to have much of a chance to settle or breed in this breeding season. The other issue that might happen there is that it's a heifer that's got a hormonal imbalance. She's got too much testosterone maybe in her bloodstream as opposed to estrogen. She's a heifer that no matter how big she gets, how old she gets, she's never going to develop properly from a reproductive standpoint. So as we look at this and look at the fitted prob probabilities as we look at these three different uh, potential track scores here, you can see that we've got better than a 75% chance of getting a heifer bred that scored a 4-4 as compared to an infantile tract heifer, a 2-2 heifer that only has about a 45% chance of, of settling. So that's a 35% that's a plus difference in those heifers. So if the heifer that's, a, that's an infantile tract heifer is just simply too young, she might work just fine for somebody else who has a later breeding season than you do, but she's probably never really going to work in your system because if she does breed, she's going to breed later in the season and that will give her less time after she calves the first time to regenerate and get herself back in shape 
to get pregnant again and stay with the mature cow herd. So this is why reproductive tract score is very important uh, and, and was a huge part of our arsenal over the years at Heartland as we managed these heifers. One more thing I'm going to mention is that this tract scoring, we routinely did this at 35 to 45 days pre-synchronized uh, breeding date. And we tried to hit that 10-day window for a couple reasons. One is that gave the heifer every opportunity to develop. And, and secondly, that allowed us to compare apples to apples because if we did that at the same time every year, within that 10-day time frame, we weren't comparing a much younger or older heifer from year to year or across groups of heifers at the yard on any given year. So that was very important to us was to try to keep that as consistent as possible. Another thing that really influences fertility in, in heifers is their nutritional development program. And this, the, developing heifers is a completely different mentality than feeding cattle. Feeding cattle, uh, feed yard managers are interested in cost to gain, cost to gain, cost to gain. The only way you can minimize cost to gain is to maximize daily rate of gain. When we're developing heifers, we're not trying to maximize rate of gain, we're trying to target rate of gain. And what this graph shows you very nicely is that, um, look at this nice bell-shaped curve that we have here. Th this graph represents some British breed biological type heifers, <coughs> excuse me, some uh, biological type heifers. And look at the bottom axis again. You can see that when heifers gained a pound or less during their developmental program, that they did an okay job breeding, but at 80%, we can do better than that, right guys? So, but look at the next one. When we had heifers throughout their entire developmental period gain somewhere between 1.1 and 1.5 pounds per head per day, look what we did with preg rate. Huge difference. We went from 80% to almost 92%. And then as we started, if, if, if a heifer gained more than that, and she started gaining too much and started putting on too much flesh, we actually were hurting ourselves because you can see that we start to come back down again at 87.5% and then heifers that gained over two pounds per day only bred up at about 84%. So, so this is very easy to tell that in British breed type, biological type cattle, what we're looking for is about that one and a half pounds per head per day gain in heifers to get them properly developed. Average daily gain is just part of the story, and it must be paired with body condition score in order to fully tell the whole story. So again, look at the research work that was done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s out there showing that body condition is very, very important to getting a heifer bred. So you can look at all these weight to height ratio, which is another way of determining body condition score for heifers that have been managed identically and fed identically is the same thing as visual body condition score, only it gives you a numerical value instead of a subjective visual score. But I'd like to point you to the second one there in particular, Cal Farrell's work in 1982 at USDA Mark. Look at what he saw. Pre pregnancy rates tend to increase to body condition score 6.7 and then decline past that point. The reason I point that out is again, the data that we collected at Heartland Cattle Company Take a look at how close we were to what Dr. Farrell found way back when in his work at USDA Mark. So again, we're looking at body condition score using the nine point system on the bottom axis of this graph. We're looking at the probabilities of getting a heifer bred on the, on the vertical axis. And look where we peak at about 6.0, 6, uh, a body condition score 6.0, we peak in terms of our chances of getting that heifer bred. So what we're telling you is that if we get a heifer in that five and a half to six body condition score, maybe even six and a quarter body condition score, we have the best chance possible of getting that heifer bred. Look what happens when you reach that 6.5, 6.7 mark that Dr. Farrell found in his research years ago. You fall off a cliff. When you get these heifers too fat and they get way too much body condition on them, what you're doing is you're putting more money into, into them, feeding them more, and you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because the more you feed them, the more they're not going to breed up because they're just too fleshy. 
So we all talk about a flushing season, a flushing time frame in which we want to give additional energy to these heifers prior to breeding, and that's absolutely a true statement. We would ideally like to do that. So if you, if you look at this graph and use this graph as your example, obviously what we'd like to do in order to provide those cattle additional energy in a flush, um, uh, flushing format prior to breeding is, is we would want to have them in no more than probably a five body condition score uh, 33 days in front of the breeding season when we add some additional energy into the ration. And then we could take them to a five and a half to ideally, in my book, it's a five, seven, five body condition score to breed them, okay? Put on an extra three quarters of a body condition score, breed those heifers at a five, seven, five. And you can tell by this graph that if you get that done, you're gonna get a good job done. Now, if you've got heifers that are in a six and a half, seven body condition score, 33 days in front of the breeding season, and you just add additional energy to the ration, you can see what's going to happen to you here. You're, you're paying more to do that, and yet you're going to get less heifers bred. You don't want heifers in a negative energy balance situation prior to breeding, but when you get heifers too fleshy too quick, you've kind of cornered yourself up in terms of how are you going to manage those heifers now to get the, get the optimum number bred. The other thing that makes a difference in heifers, uh, it relates to frame score. So, uh, this again represents a, a British breed data set um, and so basically what I'm showing you here is that those frame five heifers are going to do the best job for you getting them bred time after time after time. Heifers that are smaller than that you have less of a chance of getting them bred and heifers that become bigger than that you, you start decreasing your opportunity to get them bred. And why is that? Physiological physiologically, larger framed heifers need more time to reach puberty. We want to breed these heifers at 14 months of age, and if you've got a frame seven, eight, nine heifer, she just simply isn't ready to breed yet because she hasn't physiologically reached the point where she, she can um, show puberty. The small heifers, I think, have a number of issues associated with them. Sometimes I think they're just lesser heifers. Sometimes it's an age issue. There's all kinds of things that can go into that. If you're properly evaluating frame score, age should not be an issue, but a lot of people don't have at their hands the BIF quadratic equation to evaluate frame score. So sometimes that doesn't, doesn't get accounted for exactly correctly. So what I would tell you is that anytime you change biological type on heifers, let's say you're dealing with a set of Charolais heifers instead of a set of Angus heifers. The same, the same trends would be true. I would just argue that that whole curve would just move to the right a little bit because the middle cut of a set of Charolais heifers may be more frame six than frame five like you'd typically see in a set of British breed heifers. But the same trends will hold true. So your bottom line message here is in whatever your biological set is that you're working with, try to work with your middle cut and you might want to call those, those big kind of coarse, rough, rough looking big heifers. And you might want, to, might want to get rid of some of those smalls out of your group. And if you, if you take the heart of those heifers, uh, your opportunity to get them bred will increase dramatically. So it's important when we develop heifers, I think, that we provide them a high roughage diet. And we always provided that high roughage diet in a limit fed format. That provides a number of opportunities. Uh, number one and most important is we want to develop those heifers in a fashion in which they're gonna have to go back to the ranch and reproduce on a forage-based diet back at the ranch. So what we're doing is we're bringing heifers in for a six-month period in a semi-confinement situation, but we're simulating what they're getting in the feed bunk is we're very much simulating the same nutrition they, that they would get on ranch in terms of it being high forage. So we don't want to feed these cattle a lot of grain. If we do that over time, all we're going to do is develop a genetic set of heifers that will take a lot of energy for them to breed back as young cows and even as mature cows. And that's just additional input costs for a rancher. The rancher's most valuable resource that he has is grass, and he's got to have a set of cows that can breed on grass. 
So it's very, very important that we develop these heifers in such a manner that they will go home and develop on a for and, and breed on a forage-based diet. So if somebody uh, out there is interested in kind of big picture what we were shooting for in different phases of our breeding program, you might want to write these numbers down. This might help you over the course of time as you're working with uh, one of your own nutritionists in your own local area. So we had really three phases in our development, de developmental program, growing, flush, and bred heifer phase. So in each case, I've listed crude protein, net energy for maintenance, and net energy for gain targets for each of those three phases in the growing season. So if when, we, if we, when the heifers were in the growing phase, for example, we shot for 13.2% crude protein, uh, NEM of 66, and NEG of 42, okay? The flush program, you can see those numbers increase some because we're trying to put some additional energy into those cattle right in front of the breeding season. And then once we got those heifers bred and through the first 28 days of the breeding season, we wanted to kind of cool them back down again and harden them up, getting them ready to go back to grass. So you can see we brought the numbers back again and the NEM and the NEG numbers in the bred heifer ration are the lowest of all three. So big picture wise, what we were looking for here is in the growing phase, we wanted those heifers to gain about a pound and a half per head per day. But we didn't just put them on a straight line growth pattern like this. We plateaued and then we stepped and then we plateaued and then we stepped. This was due to some research work for a young lady that was with our program for years, uh, 25 years, uh, who did her master's work at K-State and it was her master's work that showed that if we use this plateau and step type process, we can get the heifers bred better and get better rates um, and, and not cost as much to get them there. And so this is what was a very important part of our program and, and the industry owes Janet Rippey a debt of gratitude for that research work that she did as a master's student at Kansas State. During the flush part of the program, we wanted to up those cattle's gain depending on their biological type to about a pound 75 to two pounds. And that started 33 days in front of the breeding season and lasted till day 28 of the, the breeding season. So total of about 60 days there. And then once we got them through the flush season, then we wanted to kind of back these cattle off a little bit. The reason that we kept them on the flush ration all the way through day 28 was that allowed those first service heifers to really set those pregnancies and it allowed us to get through second breeds and a, with a few extra days, seven, eight days in there before we started to back off on nutrition on those heifers. And this program seemed to work very, very well for us over a lot of years. The bred heifer phase, depending on, <clears throat> excuse me, how long the heifers stayed with us uh, uh, in, that, in that summertime, uh, at least 75 days, and some of those heifers would stay with us a bit longer if it was a drought year, something of that nature where grass was in short supply back home on the ranch. Biosecurity is very important when you're developing heifers, whether you're at home on the ranch or whether you want to take your heifers to a commercial development facility or whether you yourself want to develop a commercial develop development facility. So it's very important that the heifers have a complete vaccination program. And for us, that was actually preconditioning and weaning. I just have weaning listed there, but preconditioning and weaning. And, and, and for us, it was receiving, but maybe for you, it's transporting the heifers somewhere where you're actually gonna breed them, either another commercial operation or to another facility on your ranch. So if receiving and transportation would be this one and the same, depending on your, your, what you're doing within that system. Pre-breeding 35 to 45 days before AI, and then at preg test, at least 45 days post-breeding is when you want to do that. Uh, and we did use ultrasound to preg test. So let's very quickly go through the vaccinations that we gave at each of these uh, points in time for our heifers. And again, this might be a place where people want to take a few notes. Uh, so at five to seven months of age, and the reason I say five to seven months is, is because if you want to precondition calves before you wean them, you need to do that at least 45 days before pulling them off the cow. Because what you're doing with these vaccinations is you're actually providing them uh, some immunity to um, uh, some of these things that are listed, IBR, BVD, types one and two, PI3, BRSV. 
And so you, want, you don't want that calf to be highly stressed the first time they receive that vaccination. So if you give this 5-way MLV in a preconditioning format, you want to do this at least 45 days before you actually separate that cow and calf. This is also a great time to give pasturella uh, because this gives the opportunity for blood titers to rise to proper levels by the time that calf is actually weaned from, from his mama. Uh, you might want to give your first dose, uh, low dose, seven way Haemophilus combination. And one, you don't have to give brucellosis at preconditioning, but you want to make sure you give your bang shot uh, vaccination sometime prior to 10 months. Um, federal regulation says prior to a year of age, but anytime you can give it 10 months or earlier, you're better off because you reduce the chances of a positive titer young cow showing up. Uh, later on if she's lost her first calf and you take her to the sale barn, the closer you get to 12 months of age, the more chance you have of having a positive titer ca young cow show up at the sale barn and that can create you a lot of headaches. So at receiving at 7 to 11 months of age, uh, we gave a second round of uh, the five-way uh, modified live viral. Um, or we just gave straight IBR because if at home the rancher gave his first five-way MLV at preconditioning and then his second five-way MLV at weaning, then all we did was when they were transported to the yard is we gave the cheaper version of just straight IBR because that's your biggest uh, challenge when you're changing location on cattle uh, rather than giving the full five-way again because they've already had two doses. But if you're not sure the cattle have had two doses, you definitely need to give the five-way. And you also need to make sure that the technique was proper when they were given those five-way virals. Uh, in other words, vaccine hadn't been mixed and sitting in a fridge for a week or rolling around on the dashboard of a pickup exposed to sun and heat, those kinds of things. You need to make 100% sure that if you don't give this five-way MLV that the cattle were vaccinated properly. You need to give, if they haven't already had it, you need to give their second dose of the low dose seven way with Haemophilus. Uh, many cattle have already had both rounds by the time we'd get them, so this was on a case by case basis. We would give a pink eye vaccine at this point in time. We, we uh, uh, corrected for internal and external parasites at this point, and we also PIBVD tested anything that had not previously been tested negative at the ranch, we tested every heifer that went through the yard. Uh, so that became routine over about the last 10 years or so, the PIBVD uh, testing procedure. At pre-breeding, uh, we gave um, uh, something such as PregGuard, something of that nature, which is a 10-way MLV. Um, and here's what it protects for. Uh, there's the list, IBR, BVD types one and two, PI3, five strains of lepto. That's why this is a 10-way versus a 5-way, and then also Vibrio. So the important things there pre-breeding, Lepto and Vibrio, which you weren't seeing prior to this. Okay, we would give uh, an Ivermectin injectable at that point in time, and we would give a Haemophilus boost if the cattle had not already received their two doses. If they, if they had only gotten one dose, this was an opportunity for them to get their Haemophilus boost. And then at preg testing, a lot of this was by choice. Uh, but uh, in terms of some of the extra things that we could do for customers, but we did uh, confirm pregnancy via ultrasound. If you want a fetal sex, uh, you need to do that at 65 to 75 days of pregnancy, and you'd want to line that up with your first service heifers because that's going to represent the bulk of your heifers, uh, hopefully, if you've done things correctly. You don't want to ship pregnant heifers that are less than 45 days along. You can go to a lot of time and money and expense to get these heifers pregnant, and you can knock a pregnancy out that's less than 45 days along, particularly in hot weather or in a um, highly stressed environment in terms of the cattle being kind of cowboyed, that kind of thing. You'll knock a lot of pregnancies out, so you want to be real careful. Um, and we want to ship those heifers, at, we shipped them at 45 to 90 days of pregnancy. Of course, 70% plus of those heifers were 90 days along when they shipped. Only the third service heifers, which represented only about 5% of the pen, were at 45 days. Everything else was 60 days and longer. Ideally, you don't want to ship anything that isn't at least 60 days along. Um, and, but uh, since the 45-day pregnancies only represented about 5% of the pen, uh, 
to get those cattle back on grass, we felt like that was the best point uh, financially for their customer to get those heifers back on grass. We would provide the heifers fly control at that point, and then we had lots of options for customers depending on their on-ranch program, scour control, ranch tags, multi-men, uh, second dose of lepto, if heifers were going into very highly wooded areas with high deer populations, would highly recommend that for anybody that lives in a highly wooded area. And again, we shipped heifers all over the country, so we were dealing with a lot of different home environments. Bottom line, getting heifers bred, uh, efficient pregnancies are the goal. I think there is something to an optimal preg rate rather than a maximum preg rate. For example, when you're feeding heifers, you want to feed to the average of the pin for that, that body condition score target that we talked about. You don't want to feed to the thinnest, hardest doing heifer in the pen. You want to let Mother Nature kind of take care of her. If, she, if she's a heifer that requires that many more feed inputs than her counterparts, very frankly, she might, you might be better off if she ends up in the open pen rather than coming home. So don't feed to the, to the uh, toughest heifer in the pen, feed to the average in the pen, and let those ends kind of sort themselves off, and then you're going to get the cream of the crop coming home. Obviously, we're all interested at the end of the day in producing high-quality, consistent product. Uh, that's the goal of all of us in the beef cattle industry, and certainly our friends at Certified Angus Beef would certainly agree with that. Uh, so we want to keep that in mind, but I would also say that when you're talking about a, a selection of service sires to use on your heifers, we all have to remember that when we're trying to get heifers bred, whether you're doing it for yourself or in a commercial operation, the, our biggest profit, profitability factor is a live calf on the ground. So what we did when we selected service sires to breed these heifers to is that we had windows of acceptability, what I'm going to call that, uh, windows of acceptability for production traits, and then we'd sift a group of bulls down that met those windows of acceptability for all those production traits that would get a live calf on the ground that would grow and, and produce and be efficient. And, and then we would take into account carcass traits, certainly, but we have to get that live calf on the ground in order for carcass traits to, expect, to express themselves. Uh, so just a comment that I would make there. So we felt like we had ma seven major challenges that we could help ranchers with. And whether you're in a commercial operation or developing your own heifers, these challenges are the same for all of us. So one of the things we wanted to help our customers with is we wanted to place selection pressure on fertility. And the way that you can best do that is to provide those heifers no free passes. And don't provide them any opportunity to make you work harder for them rather than the other way around. The best way you can do this, number one, is to closely control nutrition. And there's, there's an ongoing debate in the industry that's been going on for a number of years now in terms of what is the best level to develop heifers at. Should it be 50% of the mature body weight, 55, 60, or 65%? I'm a 60% I'm a believer. I think 65%, those heifers are getting a little fleshy, to be honest with you. I, a 60% seems to me to make some sense from the standpoint that we're limit feeding those cattle. We're getting enough condition on those cattle to get the bulk of them bred, but we're not feeding to the hardest doing heifer in the pen. My feeling is, is when you develop those heifers to 50 or 55% of their mature body weight, those heifers are pretty marginal in terms of their body condition. And if those heifers go into any kind of tough weather, and they're pregnant now, the, now you're playing catch up with a young heifer, and now she's also trying to feed a fetus. And so the best uh, efficiency of gain is prior to her being pregnant to provide a little uh, cushion, if you will, in terms of body condition. So if those heifers go into a tough winter, they don't fall so far behind that you're trying to play catch up. Now you're overfeeding the heifer, She's shunning all that nutri extra nutrition to the calf. She's not putting on body condition herself. And now you've got the unintended consequence when they calve of a calf that's bigger and more calving difficulty. So I'm a 60% believer for those reasons. The, the, on top of that, there's been a lot of research done in the industry out there that shows that the best way that you can develop long-term fertility in your cow herd isn't by trying to starve it out of them, 
but to limit the breeding season. So I would say that if you limit the breeding season to 45 days or less, and we probably had about uh, uh, 40 to 50% uh, of our customers actually chose a 35-day AI season with no cleanup bulls, that only gave those heifers two chances at an AI conception. And if you do that routinely over a lot of years, you're going to build some inherent fertility in your cow herd. It may be kind of hard to take the first year or two if you've got to spread and age in those cattle or whatever the case might be. But over the course of time, that is something that will pay you many dividends over and over and over again, is if you limit the breeding season to at least 45 days or less. And I would argue 35 days is the better way to go. So another rancher challenge is always to enhance calf crop value and when you employ AI, you can get the very best genetics available via AI sires for fertility, maternal growth and meat characteristics. Uh, that's something we're all looking for every day in all of our cattle operations. AI allows us to do this quicker and faster and with higher accuracy rates uh, than natural service in many cases. Uh, we want to retain, retain um, uh, young cows in the herd. If we can improve retention of these young cows, we've gone a long ways toward really helping the rancher with his entire cow herd business model. The biggest financial drain for any rancher is not his replacement heifers. It's getting a replacement heifer, getting one calf out of her, and he can't get her rebred for a second or a third calf. If you, if you look at financial data in any, in any situation, in any ranch, this is the financial drain for most ranchers because they've got maximum input in that heifer at that point and just have a single calf out of her and now they've got a salvager. So we can do that by properly developing heifers from weaning to first breeding via their nutrition program, proper culling, Timing of breeding, we want to breed those heifers 30 to, uh, tw 20, at least 30 days, uh, 21 to 30 days in front of the mature cow herd. That does two things for you. That gives that young heifer an extra cycle to regenerate and stay with that mature cow herd. It also allows you to uh, develop 100% of your attention on calving those heifers before your cow herd starts and you have those heifers out of the way before your cows start calving. You'll have less calving difficulty if you do a good job selecting calving ease sires, so all those things play into it. We want to increase pounds of beef wean per acre of grass. So the, the cattle in a rancher's herd that's going to do that are those mature producing cow units. Cull cows aren't going to do that for him and heifers aren't going to do that for him because again, you get no saleable product out of a replacement heifer for two and a half years. So if you can find a way to handle your heifers in a different manner, not necessarily taking them to a commercial operation, but even on your own ranch, if you can free up ranch grass resources for additional mature producing cows, what you're gonna find is that you're going to make better use of your most valuable resource, which is your grass. Bull management and costs. If you use AI, you, you eliminate the need for on-site heifer bulls. So you're gonna reduce some cash outlay. You can use higher accuracy sires uh, on, your, on your heifers uh, where calving ease is very important to you. And probably most importantly, logistically for most ranchers is it simplifies pasture management uh, because you don't need as many, as many different pastures to manage different age groups of heifers, young cows, and mature cows. Cow herd temperament's an important thing, and it's something we paid a whole lot of attention to at Heartland. I had a group that was a big believer in effective stockmanship, and they practiced it every single day and worked at it really hard. And it was a point of pride for us to, to take a set of heifers that came into us uh, that maybe were a little high-headed and send them home easier to handle than when they showed up. And it'll help you with your cow herd. If you can do this with your heifers over the course of four, five, six, seven years, you can change a cow herd back home, regardless of how they're handled back home. Because, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna start settling those cattle down and then the cattle that are still high headed, we're gonna put a hard knock on them in terms of culling them. If you've got that heifer that kind of circles her herd mates out on the outer edge when you're in the pen, for example, you need, to, you need to note that and mark that down, and if she continually does that, it's probably a heifer you need to get rid of because she's an instigator, she'll, she'll stir the whole group up, 
And it's amazing to me, we've seen it time after time after time, you can get rid of one troublemaker in a pen and an entire group will just settle down and it's all due to one heifer. So, but if we, if we settle those cattle, we can improve fertility, performance, immunity, meat quality, all kinds of things. And probably the most important thing is your work days just become easier and safer all the way down the line. Data management and summary was a big part of our program. Uh, this young lady here, she, this, is, this is Janet Rippey. She's the one who did the research work that I talked about earlier with the plateauing and the stepping during the growing phase of the, of the developmental program. Uh, Janet was also our computer technology expert and she did a great job for our customers summarizing data, uh, turning that data into useful information with take home points one or two or three take home points that a person could actually go back and work on and make a difference in. I think we're a data rich and information poor industry. Uh, if you've got somebody in your team that can take data and turn it into useful information, you've got a real treasure and it's something that more of our operations need to pay more attention to. We need to place a high value on economically important traits. I think this is also a very important thing. I see, I see a lot of people kind of getting caught up in things that economically really don't matter a lot. But take a look at this list. We all know that fertility is our bottom line most important economic trait that we can work with. Longevity. We've talked about keeping those young cows in the herd. Um, if you get a heifer developed correctly, get her bred right according to the mature cow herd, your chances of that heifer staying in that mature cow herd for her productive lifetime increases hugely and that will make a big difference in your overall average longevity in your herd. Immune response is a big deal and, and I think it's something that doesn't get talked about near enough in our industry. We weaned a lot of calves over the years and there is a big difference in cattle and sources and, and uh, um, how those cattle have been vaccinated and, and just their inherent immune response in terms of how they get through the weaning process and then ultimately the feed yard process. Fleshing ability, again, we want to get rid of those kind of hard doing, hard fleshing kind of cattle. And disposition, we've talked about it quite a bit. We can reduce injury to cattle and people. And certainly it has a big effect, again, going to our certified Angus beef friends, it has a big effect for us in carcass quality and red meat yield. So just to complete here, I just want to talk about just the two or three things here that we did in our program uh, that allowed us to get the rates that we did. And, and not everybody doesn't need to use this same program, but this is the program that we used. We synchronized the heifers using the Colorado MGA synchronization procedure. Uh, that's one of the original synchronization programs developed by Ken Odie at Colorado State. That's why it's referred to as the Colorado system. Uh, and it's very simply feeding uh, oral MGA at half a milligram per head per day for 14 days, followed 19 days later with a shot of prostaglandin, and then heat visual heat detection after that. This is not a time insemination program. This is breeding according to visual heat detection. Uh, that's what we did in our program. I know a lot of people don't have that labor supply. I had a very experienced crew and you can trade one kind of labor for another. Um, this particular group was very good at this. It's the way we were designed. It's the way we were set up and that, that's what we used. You need to manage your hot pen cattle. So if you've got a synchronization going on, a 100 head group or a 300 head group or whatever it is, you've got to manage the hot pen. And by that, I mean what you need to do is when you find heifers in heat, you need to sort them out of the pen and get them separate from the cattle that haven't yet shown heat. Keep the hot pen cleaned up, in other words. We had one very simple rule that we used for our crew when we were working hot pens. And that is that we needed to see at least two good stands out of a heifer before she was eligible to be sorted. That seems like a very simple, uh, you know, over the top kind of rule from the standpoint of its, its simplicity. But honestly, when we implemented the two stand rule, it took care of about 98% of any inaccuracies that might occur. A misread tag or a heifer showing copycat behavior that really wasn't in heat. 
Um, it took care of virtually all that by implementing that one simple rule. So you don't want a heifer that's running out from a stand, you know, she's not ready yet. Or, you know, and it's very easy when you've got, you know, 120 head and a pen to misread a tag, number switch, do those kind of things. So if you just implement that rule, you'll take care of all those things. You want to keep your hots, your cool offs, and your non-responders separate. Um, and that's very important from the standpoint of you don't want to handle the cattle any more than necessary. And you want it, the cattle that have just left the breeding barn, you want them to go to what we call the cool off pen, not put them back into a den of activity with some hot heifers. Number one, it increases your numbers that you have to look through. Number two, those cattle need to go back and rest because they've just been through the, the heat period themselves and they need to go back and eat and lay down and, and, and uh, cool off, so to speak, which is why we termed it that. We used the AMPM rule for breeding. If we saw them in heat in the evening, we bred them in the morning, vice versa. Saw them in heat in the morning, we bred in the evening. We pulled individual straws of semen as each individual heifer hit the breeding chute or the on deck position. And we timed those straws of semen uh, in the warm water bath. We didn't just pull 25 straws of semen in a single bull breed and whenever we got to it, we got to that straw of semen. Uh, we pulled individual straws and timed every straw of semen. And then we did implement effective stockmanship techniques all the way through the developmental program. Particularly when we bred the heifers, we wanted to keep those heifers as quiet and easy handling as possible. And uh, I think uh, that crew did a very good job of it. And I think it was one of the reasons that we saw the kind of fertility that we saw in our cattle over time. So just to complete here, this is the same slide I showed you early in the program. I just want to show it to you again using these techniques that I just described to you. Again, we were able to achieve over a 30 year period 93% sync rate uh, on average, uh, first service conception rate 70%, preg rate over a, after a 45 day total AI program, no cleanup bulls, 90%. And this is how we managed to achieve these numbers. And we implemented these same management procedures from day one of the business uh, till the end of the business when I sold uh, the yard in the fall of 2018. Um, so with that, I hope there's some things that you were able to take out of this conversation this evening and some things that you might want to implement in your fall breeding program or next spring's breeding program uh, as you set your heifers up uh, uh, in the future. And uh, uh, if there's anything that we can do to help you out with some questions or anything, please don't hesitate to let me know. Yep, yep. Thank you, Patsy. That was a great presentation. Um, I think we've got some great questions for you as well. Um, you guys can continue to ask questions to um, Patsy or myself through that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So just type those in, hit send, and we'll try to get those answered for you. Um, if you don't, then please contact Patsy at patsy at heartlandcattle.com, and she will get those um, answered for you after this broadcast. So, um, Patsy, I guess first question. Um, is there any supplement to help the cow get into breeding if she's a slow breeder? Any supplement? Yes. Well, I, a supplement per se, I, I, I don't know about that, but one thing I will mention, and I actually meant to mention it in my presentation, is you want to maintain a proper energy to protein balance. Mm -hmm. So people in uh, cattle that are developed, heifers that are developed on wheat pasture, for example, Sometimes they can show a little lesser breeding, uh, breed up rate. And, and what that is, is young wheat uh, is very high in protein. Number one, it's got a lot of moisture in it. So it's hard for that heifer to get enough dry matter intake uh, to fill her needs because she's e uh, eating a very washy type product. Okay. But secondly is that young wheat product is very high in protein. And sometimes that energy to protein balance can get out of whack. Uh, so probably the way I'd answer that question, Emily, is uh, to be concerned about that. In terms of a commercial supplement or something of that nature, I don't know that we necessarily need to get into a particular product this evening. Uh, I, think, I think an overall balanced ration, trying to hit those crude protein, NEM and NEG requirements that I listed earlier, and working with your local nutritionist, somebody that you've got a lot of faith in, is probably the best way you can go about that. Okay, okay. 
Um, what is the best weight range for an Angus heifer at breeding? So it, it, it depends on the Angus heifer, you know, <laughs> so that, that's, I don't know that I can give you that weight per se, but if, if, uh, if, we're, if we're shooting for 60% of her mature weight and you've got some cow herd history behind her, you know, what's her mom away, that kind of thing. And here's something that a person needs to be aware of. When we talk about a percent of body weight, the other thing we're looking at there is we're looking for those body condition scores that correspond. Mm -hmm. So none of us really develop heifers, in my opinion, using the scale. For example, we bred 5,000 heifers every year. If we weighed all those heifers every two weeks, that's mm -hmm. all we would have got done. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we were doing, we all in academia, and I put myself in this same category because it's where I came from, we all talk about developing heifers to a percent of their body weight. But what we're really doing is we're targeting body condition score. And if you target the correct body condition scores and then calculate backwards, you'll see that those, that 60% of her body weight is true. Mm -hmm. It's a real deal. So let's talk about targeting body condition score instead of weight. So what I want to do is when I've, got a, when I've got a heifer 33 days in front of the breeding season, at the same time I add MGA into a ration, I also want to add some additional energy into a ration. So I want that heifer at the top end of a, a body condition score four right on the edge of a five. I want to right on that 5.0. And then I want, to, I want to increase her average daily gain to about a pound seven five to a pound eight five, depending on her size, because mm -hmm. we can have different biological types just within the, the Angus breed, right? right? Yep. Okay, so that's gonna vary depending on if you've got a frame five heifer versus a frame six or six and a half heifer. But I want to take that heifer through from a body condition score five to about a 575 ideally, a 575 to the edge of a six. So I want to have her gain about three quarters of a body condition score to a one full body condition score, okay. okay, is where I'm at. And then if you come back and you calculate backwards, essentially what you're going to find is that she is going to be at about 60% of her mature body weight. And if you use her mama as the guide, uh, I think that's what you're going to find. A lot of ranchers make a mistake of way, way underestimating their mature cow body weight, right? <laughs> because the only time they weigh cows is some cull cows going to town, right? Right. And they know what those cows weighed and that's, and that's where they get the, these weights. But that's not representative of their mature producing mm -hmm. cow herd. So you've got to have a good idea of the actual mature producing cow herd weight before you can do that. But if you target those body condition scores, you're going to have it right all day and all night. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, next question. Do you change the percent of protein in feed during the hot summer months? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you you want to make sure that those cattle don't get deficient in protein. Uh, but uh, from a heat management standpoint, heat increment and those kinds of things can play into a problem. Uh, in terms of heat load on those heifers and making sure they maintain their pregnancy. So I'm, I'm not going to say that I changed the protein that much because we're just hitting those appropriate levels. But what I am trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that we're providing feed to those cattle at a correct time mm -hmm. to where we can uh, reduce the heat load on those cattle as much as possible. You don't want to get into a situation where you try to correct one problem by going overboard and doing and this, doing and something. now you've, you've created two more problems. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, for bull breeding system, would you recommend extending the breeding system for more than 45 days, particularly when you're using large pasture ranges like we have in the Southwest? Um, it's a possibility. Uh, if, if you're natural service and if you're in a big range situation, you know, different parts of the country need different situations as, a, as opposed to maybe smaller paddocks that are used in, in high, high green grass mm -hmm. areas, upper Midwest, those kinds of things. So that's sure a possibility. Um, um, I hadn't really thought about that too much, but the, it's, it's a possibility. That may, be, that may be something where you might want to extend your season to 60 days or something like that to provide a little additional uh, time uh, when you've got those kind of um, more hostile um, environments, mm -hmm. if you will, to mm -hmm. getting a heifer bred. Uh, but I wouldn't go too long uh, uh, because then, again, what you're doing is you're providing 
providing that heifer too many chances to stay in the herd when maybe she's something that isn't as productive as you'd like her to be. Okay. Um, you said 60% of mature weight is ideal mm -hmm. at breeding. As we push for higher growth, what is the best weight to predict mature weight? Well, um, again, I, you know, what you need to do is just have some true uh, weights on those cattle, um, you know, in, in, their, in their production system, not cull cows. Mm -hmm. uh, so just, just knowing where you're really at. Like I said, pro if, if we have any issues out there in the industry, most cattlemen will tend to us underestimate their mature cow weight rather than the other way around. And again, I think that comes from using cows as an example that don't represent their producing cow units. Okay. That, would be, that would be my take on that. So what I would do is try to find a way to weigh cows when you're working them anyway with vaccinations. And not just at one time of the year, but if you, could, if you can weigh cows each time you're putting them through the chute uh, for vaccinating and those kinds of things. And, and then, uh, you know, take a look at those differences from uh, spring to fall, for example, okay. and and work with those differences at different times of the year or an average or something of that nature. Okay. Um, what is your opinion of MGA versus Cedar? Like you use okay. MGA at your program. Um, so what is your opinion of MGA versus a Cedar program um, as compared to pulling a Cedar and taking a hormone out immediately? Okay. Um, we used MGA because mm -hmm. we were in a semi-confinement situation. We were running a feed truck by those heifers every day anyway. We could provide with our feed, uh, our, our mixer feed trucks, we could provide a good mix and we could provide that product at two to three cents per head per day, much cheaper than a cedar. We also didn't have to work 5,000 heifers once to put the cedar in, another time to take the cedar out. So that was 10,000 more head of cattle through the processing barn during what was already a very busy time. So for us, oral MGA worked the best. If you're in a ranch situation, however, I don't want, I don't want to diss cedars because there's a place for them. Uh, if you're in a ranch situation where you don't feel like you can get oral MGA into those cattle in a even a nice mix in their feed and everything has the same chance at, at uh, oral MGA, Many ranch situations are much better designed to use cedars, and you're not working with the huge numbers, so if you have to work a set of heifers through a chute two more times, the workload isn't near like what it was for us in that commercial situation. So many ranch situations, I would say the cedar is probably the more ideal way to go. In mm -hmm. our situation, uh, that was not the case because of cost and labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know a lot of ranching yeah. situations use cedars on their cows and stuff. Yeah. Um, so what about Neospora testing prior to or at receiving? Uh, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, that's not something we did uh, in our program and never really had a problem with it. If you're in a part of the country that has a known problem with that, sure, something to consider. And I, I, what I would tell everybody to do is work with their local veterinarian okay. uh, on some of these testing procedures. What's, what's an issue in your part of the world versus somebody who's, you know, on the other corner of the country? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, yeah, absolutely. If that's something that you have a known problem with, uh, it's something that you should consider. And, and parts of the country with abandoned dairies, um, that people have taken over and put beef cattle into, that can be an issue, mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, what is the ideal pen size when developing heifers? So at Heartland, we had 50, 60, 80, and 120 head pens, okay? And I, I would not be comfortable getting more than 120 head in a pen, in a hot pen at any one point in time. So the way we'd work those are 50 and 60 head pins. We might put a person in there on foot or on horseback, depending on the cattle, depending on the person, uh, which way they can work more effectively. We, we worked hard at working with cattle both on foot and on horseback. We wanted cattle to handle easily both ways, depending on the pin sometimes in terms of how easy the cattle were to work out of a particular pin. If we had a 120 head pin, uh, we would put two horses and riders in there, and two, two people could easily handle a 120 head pin. And then as your numbers started to dwindle, 
you know, then what you'd do is you'd consolidate your non-responders. So say we had a customer that we had a 300 head sink going mm -hmm. and he had 300 head pens. So we'd start with, we'd start with uh, uh, the three 100 head pens and then after we got that first 30% sorted off in the 48 hour sort, then we'd combine pins the next morning and then we'd combine further. Okay. And so your non-responders get to be a smaller and smaller group. And then, uh, but uh, we, we in, in our group with our level of experience and horse skills and so on and so forth, one person could easily handle a 60 head pin. Uh, many times we had one rider in an 80 head pin. Uh, 100 and 120 head pins, we'd typically start with two, but we'd usually shift somebody once we got 20% of the heifer sorted. Okay. We'd, ship, we'd shift them to another job. And a majority of the stuff that you did at Heartland was on horseback, correct? Yes. The majority of it was. Uh, we, you know, I, I made sure that cattle were handled both on foot and horseback. Um, you know, we had cattle coming from all over the country and uh, for example, we had some groups come out of the Sand Hills in Nebraska that the first time somebody set foot in their pen on foot, they were all on the back <laughs> fence, you know, looking at you because they, they're not used to seeing that two-legged creature. Uh -huh. If you rode in their pen, they'd ignore you. Uh, likewise, we had cattle coming from other parts of the world that, uh, you know, really hadn't been exposed to horses. And uh, we had the opposite experience. So uh, when we were developing those heifers, we made a point of handling all those heifers both on horseback and on foot because regardless of which extreme we were dealing with, by the time they left, we wanted those cattle to be uh, comfortable either way. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, so what is the best way to keep coal heifers from cycling when they are finished out for harvest? Well, if you want to keep them from cycling, that's feeding long-term MGA. But do not, do not mistake that with synchronizing heifers with MGA. In fact, I'm glad you brought that question up, probably not so much for the actual question that you asked, Emily. But uh, something that people will, a mistake that I think they make is when they wean their calves and they, and they are backgrounding them before they want to develop heifers, they'll, uh, they'll put them in a pen with steer calves and they'll feed, uh, or, or they'll just feed them by themselves, but they'll, they'll put, uh, they'll put it long-term MGA in the feed. Long-term MGA does not have a great effect on overall fertility over time. So you don't, you don't want to go there if you can help it. And we've, we've had, we've, over the years, we've had the occasional new customer make that mistake. And the first year they brought us heifers, you know, their fertility was back. And then once they learned that lesson and didn't, didn't do that in subsequent years, they were okay. Uh, but uh, you, you don't want to feed long-term MGA if you ever, ever want to breed that heifer. Uh, implants, uh, same thing. If you, if you know you want to breed a heifer, don't put an implant in her. You know, there's, there is the thought process that uh, an implanted heifer has a bigger pelvic area. And when you measure them at a year of age, that's true. But at two years of age, when they actually calve, that's no longer true. So some people will implant saying, well, I want to implant her because she's got a bigger pelvic area and she'll, she'll calve easier. Uh, that's not a true statement because by the time they reach two years of age, that advantage has gone away. And in the meantime, you have, uh, what you've done is you've changed physiologically that heifer and you have to feed her harder to get her to puberty. And so you've, with, with putting a product in her that costs money to begin with, now you've cost yourself more money because you're going to have to feed her harder to get her over that physiological growth curve. Mm -hmm. And so now you've kind of shot yourself in the foot two ways financially. So if you know you're going to breed a heifer, just stay away from implants. There's just, just, no, just no need to go there. Okay. All right, guys. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have, Patsy. So um, again, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, on behalf of all the staff here at Angus University, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And um, we are excited to announce our next webinar, Breeding and Buying Bulls for the Brand, How Can You Get on Target? This will be held on June 23rd, and we hope you will join us. Um, after we finish, you guys will be redirected um, to a survey, and we would really appreciate it if you guys give us that feedback. We, more than, we are more than willing to help you guys in any way that we can and help you be better cattlemen and women. Um, and the full recording of this webinar will also be um, on our 
news and announcement section on the homepage and then also on um, Angus TV. And so feel free to share this video with anybody that you might think uh, would be interested in this topic. Um, once again, thank you for joining us this evening and we hope that you will join us on June 23rd where Kara Lee from Certified Angus Beef will be joining us that evening. And um, for any other questions regarding um, this webinar, um, please visit angus.org or email us or you can contact us at 816-383-5100. Um, thank you, Patsy, and have a good night. Stay safe.